So I have a story to tell from my week that is, I have debated on whether to tell it or not because I know that it's going to really make some people upset. But it's very important that especially those who are followers of Jesus know the impact they're having on other people in this day and age. It's very important. So I'm going to tell the story. I went to um, a metro jail this week. Um, I visit a young woman there every other week and it's a very large jail and she's someone I've known for about 10 years so I've had a lot of history with her and a couple of years ago she started calling me a lot because you know she was having a lot of um, she'd relapsed and she was having quite a few um, what would feel like what we would think of as very paranoid very paranoid behavior you know when they call and they say there's people that are looking in my peephole you know that kind of stuff and and everyone's like oh they're doing that again and so it's been kind of a rough few years with her and last July she was calling me because I remember where I was driving when it happened because I actually went to her because I was afraid for her and she was telling me that you know she was being followed and um, she was afraid of me coming to her because she says then they'll start following you and I'm thinking but I said, I'm not worried. I'm not doing anything illegal. And she says, well, no, if you come to me, they're going to they're gonna take down your license plate and they're going to start following you. And I'm like, so that is a very common thing that I experience. And so when you know a lot of people that are in this lifestyle of drugs in, and alcohol psychosis, the kind of things they start to experience, you're trying to determine, is this real, is this not real? And you're trying to determine. But at the same time, what I've come to learn over time is that there are many things in the story that are true. Many things that they say they're paranoid about or they're worried about or fearful about actually end up becoming factual. They're, they're true statements. And when somebody says they're being followed, in this case with this young woman she was being followed and she was correct that when i went to see her my license plate got taken down and i was put on the list of people and it was very intriguing to me that she was right about that regardless she ended up in jail in january and now it's september and she just took a deal for 10 years federal time she took the deal for 10 years because if she took it to trial, it was gonna result in a lot longer sentence. Her peer that is in with her just took a deal for 15 years, another young woman. And so what these women were expressing to their family and friends as, this is what's happening in my life, these people are following me, um, my phone's being bugged, all these things was very true. So now I bring it to what happened with that story. She says, have you noticed today the people that are calling themselves Christians are acting the same way? She said they do the same thing as we do. They're, they act and talk like they're they're, they act and talk like we do. They, they talk about all these delusional type things and everybody is saying, oh, those crazy people. But yet we all know that some of it's probably true and they insist that it's true, just like people in drugs insist that they're being followed. They said, it's so similar that we sit here and talk about they're just like us. They pick this subject, they pick this person, they pick this topic, they pick this opinion, and they just ruminate on it. They ruminate and they ruminate and they ruminate, and it becomes this thing where you don't even wanna be around them anymore because they just keep bringing this thing up. And you're like, can we talk about something else, please? But they just keep going on this topic. And so they compared a great majority of the people that they used to 
think were very focused on correct things for Jesus, they compared it to themselves. And they said, they're very similar to us. I said, what do you think the common thread is when you, com when you compare it? What do you see as, what's your comparison? What's the, the core commonality there? And they said, this woman said, they don't trust that God is sovereign. They obviously don't trust that God is sovereign. They sound so similar. They don't dwell on the one topic, which is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not about rescuing the lost. They're all about fighting some kind of a cause, whatever that is. There's a variety of them. They're critical. They're distracted. They won't listen. They're quick to judge. They're always arguing and dividing the body over opinions and differences in opinions. And they're not interested in serving. In fact, this woman said, it's very hard for me to get someone who will just come and read the Bible to me and will just come visit me in jail because they care about me. I can't find anyone to do that. Hardly anyone cares about us that is capable of coming in here and just sharing the Bible with me. They are not interested in that. I said, what do you think the solution is to this problem? And she says, well, first of all, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that should be what you're talking about, not about the election, not about there's conversations that can be had about that, but that should not be your fixation. She said, that should not be the thing. If you're genuinely trying to build the kingdom, your topic should be Jesus Christ and eternity. That should be your topic. That should be what you're known for. That should be what people say. If you strike up a conversation with them, they're going to keep it to the gospel. They're focused on the mission. I asked her what worked for her. She said, believe it or not, getting thrown in seg worked for her. She got put in seg for 30 days when she got there because there was some conflict in the, in the women's unit. She said in segregation, she just had a few books. That was it. She's locked in a cell by herself. She said that cut off the access to all the paranoid, who got arrested, who's, the, who's snitching on who. She said it cut all that off from her. And she said, it was like my mind detoxed from all this information. She said, I just got somewhat of a sense of peace in my head for the first time. She said, from things that were very true because people were coming into jail that certainly were part of these conversations. It was true information. But she said, in segregation, I could only pick up the information that was in the books I was reading. And the books I was reading didn't talk about who was being investigated and who was using this drug and who was doing that, who was hanging with who, who's not to be trusted. She said, none of that was in those books. Then she said she came out of SEG and immediately it flared right back up. She got with the same people, of course, because they're in the cell. It all starts the same thing all over again. And she said, I thought, oh, no, I can't do this again. Now she felt the impact of it. Like, mm -hmm. I recognize now how crazy I was acting. I didn't see it at the time, but now I see it. How that looked and how I looked. I looked obsessed. And she said, I put myself back in SEG. I asked them to put me back in SEG to get me away from it so I could make a plan for coming out of SEG. Since I'm not gonna get out of jail, I need a plan to come out of SEG and not become that way again. So she said she made decisions in SEG to fast all media. She said, I'm not gonna watch the news because I don't wanna hear it. I don't want to know what it says. It could be true. It may not be true. People seem to think it's true, but she said, I don't want to hear it. It's not going to help my life, and it's not going to make me an ambassador for Jesus in jail to watch the news because it messes up my head. Then she said, I started fasting conversations with people who talked about the things that would make her get spinning on them. So she said, if they started that, she would say, stop, just stop. I respect that but stop with me stop with me i can't do that again i just need peace in my head i want to read the bible and i want to be able to understand it and i want to be able to read again 
and understand what I'm reading. And I can't if I've got all that in my head. So she said, I stopped people from talking to me about those things. Most of them were true. She just said, it's not what God wants from me. So she said, now I read my Bible. I read my Bible to the other women and we're all learning to unplug from all that information because it's killing our minds. It's killing our ability to hear from God. And we end up in this cesspool of toxic talk, toxic, just ruminating, arguing about, well, I don't think they're true. No, I think that guy's right. She said, we won't do it anymore. She said, we want to be different. We don't want to be those kind of people anymore. And I told her, I'm really humbled that I got to hear this conversation <laughs> because I said, I completely hear you. I'm out here in the real world. And I said, I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to share what you just shared with me because I think that we all could learn some things that you guys were forced to learn because you could get away from it. And then you made yourself get away from it. You prioritized that this was not the way you were going to use your mind. So with that, all of that, when her, her conclusion was that the majority of Christians that they're hearing from do not understand or believe that God is sovereign. They don't believe it. So if you were to look up the word sovereign in the dictionary, it shows words like superior, greatest, supreme in power and authority, ruler, independent of all others in its definition. And the best way to explain it according to the Bible is God is in control. You either believe it or you don't. The Bible definition and context of sovereign is there's absolutely nothing that happens in this universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. And as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, God has no limitations. There's just a few claims in the Bible that are made about this. God is above all things, before all things. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's immortal. He's present everywhere so that everyone can know him. According to Revelation 21.6. Colossians 1.16 says, God created all things and holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible. Romans 11.33 says, God knows all things, past, present, and future. There is no limit to his knowledge, for God knows everything completely before it even happens. Jeremiah 32.17 says, God can do all things and accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for him, and he orchestrates and determines everything that is going to happen in your life, in my life, throughout the world, whatever he wants to do in the universe, he does for nothing is impossible with him. Psalm 103, 19, God is in control over all things, rules over all things. He has power and authority over nature, nature earthly kings, history, angels, demons. Even Satan himself has to ask God's permission before he can act against believers. And that's what being sovereign means. It means being the ultimate source of all power, authority, and everything that exists. Only God can make those claims. Therefore, it's God's sovereignty that makes him superior to all other gods and makes him alone worthy of our worship. God's sovereignty is one of the most important things to understand as a Christian, but it also is one of the most argued subjects amongst Christians. And it can be they're arguing the sovereignty of God, but they could just be arguing and it is caught in that they do not believe God is sovereign. Their argument falls on the side that I don't believe he is by the way they default. Most Christian denominations agree that God surpasses all others in power and authority and his sovereignty is a natural outcome of his omniscience, which means he knows all, omnipotence, which means he has unlimited power, and omnipresent, which is he's present everywhere, at the same time. He's everywhere. What is argued is to what extent he applies his sovereignty, especially how he exerts over the will of man. And when we speak of the sovereignty of God, we mean he rules the universe, but then the debate begins over how does he do that? How direct is that? How indirect is that? And how does that apply to my life? 
The Bible describes God as offering us choices. He holds us personally responsible for our choices. And it also states that he is very unhappy with some of our choices. The fact that sin exists at all proves that there's things that do occur that definitely were not caused by God who is holy. And if it doesn't fall under holy, he did not cause it. The reality of human free will and accountability sets the maximum boundary for God's sovereign control over the universe, which is to say there's a point at which God chooses to allow things that he does not directly cause. An example, if a man were to put a mouse in a bowl, the sovereignty of the man over the mouse is not in doubt. The mouse may try to crawl out and the man may not want that to happen. But the man is not forced to crush the mouse, drown the mouse, or pick it up. The man, for reasons of his own, may choose to let that mouse get away. But the man is still in control. And there's a difference between allowing the mouse to leave the bowl and helplessly watching as it escapes by giving it a choice to just go kill itself somewhere. The false version of God's sovereignty implies that, implies that if the man is not actively holding the mouse inside the bowl, then he must not be able to keep it there at all. That's not a true version of sovereignty, but many actually think that. God has the ability to do anything, to take action, and to intervene in any situation, but he often chooses to act indirectly or to allow certain things for reasons of his own. Either way, he accomplishes his will. Today I visited an old friend and I met this friend back when he was a very vibrant person, um, was a, he was caught in addiction, but he was a very vibrant person. I ran into him on social media a while back and connected with him and went to visit him. I heard he had some issues so I went to visit him a few months ago and when I go inside of his building because he had to pop the door there's a man in a wheelchair sitting to the side and this man was in one of those wheelchairs that is really high tech like it there's nothing about that man that's mobile and so he says hi to me by name when I walked in and I looked at this guy and I don't know this guy I've never met him in my life but I looked at him and I said how do you know me and he said, I'm so-and-so, the person I came there to visit. And I was like, I was so shocked. I followed him back to his apartment where he ran his chair with a, a barely mobile hand, but it had like a couple metal things on it that allowed him to operate this chair. I went to visit him today in his apartment, and he was showing me how he had made with two hands that he has no feeling in, just the tips of two fingers, how he had made a hook that started, he said, his prototype was a hanger. And he had had somebody cut the hanger so that he could sit and bend that hanger into the shape that he needed it to be to do some things. And he listed what those things were. And some of them are really basic functions that the rest of us totally take for granted don't even process with our mind. But he has to clearly put a lot of thought into it and it takes him a long time to do those things. And now he built himself this hook that I would look at and think, okay, that's trash, I would throw that away. But to him, it's like this changed my life. My PCA doesn't have to do about 10 to 20% of what they used to have to do because I made this hook because if it didn't quite do what I needed it to do for that thing, I shaped it a little different and I made it work. And now I'm letting other people know, hey, I can do this for you too. I can make you one of these. And this is how it works. And they're all very excited because they don't have the creative mind like he does. And they're very thankful that he has the ability to see what they need and he said, do you know what the problem is today with people? They don't listen. They don't look at me and listen because I've gone to everyone who keeps making my brace fit me better, doesn't leave rash or sores because he can't feel them. 
and I've said, I need to be able to do this. There's got to be a way. And they say, no, there isn't. And they don't change anything. He said, no one will listen. No one will care. And I know there's a way. I know there's a way. So he did it himself without being able to even use these hands. He just sat for days and did this with a hanger, bending it on his table. I thought about that today when I was thinking about talking about the sovereignty of God and I thought God did not allow what happened to this man that he did not direct that because this was in a, a crash a DUI crash where he was thrown from the vehicle and he wasn't found for a long time and he did not know he was paralyzed because he could feel nothing from the neck down he still cannot he has no ability to feel even if he has a sore until it goes deep in, then he knows he has a sore because he can't even feel when he's injured. But in, and he also wanted to commit suicide, but he couldn't. He said for the first few years, he begged people to just tip him off his chair so that he wouldn't be able to breathe and then he would suffocate, but they wouldn't. They strapped him so that he couldn't do that. And now he's like, okay, I'm here, I'm alive. He's one of the most interesting people for me to talk to because he talks about things completely different than everyone else I know. Because what has become important to him, it's amazing how much we take for granted, which is about everything. And I am amazed that I got to meet him like this because I get to see through a set of eyes that makes me look at my whole life and go, we complain about the dumbest things we complain about the dumbest things. We sit all day and stew on these things. When this man needs someone to come every three days and set him on the toilet, he doesn't even know when he has to go. They just set him there and hope he goes and they wait for a few hours and take him off. We take everything for granted. But he used this condition to think and make something for others in his condition that is going to change abilities that they have and I think how many of us do that how many of us even care about the other people that are like us struggling like us how many are willing to put that much effort into something so that it will help the others who are struggling anyway I am super inspired by him and I wish I knew more people like him God's sovereignty means that he is absolute in his authority and he's unrestricted in his supremacy. And everything that happens is at the very least a result of him permitting it. And this holds true even if specific things are not what he would prefer. The right of God to allow mankind free choice is just as necessary for true sovereignty as his ability to enact his will wherever and however he chooses. Andrew Womack did a a teaching on the sovereignty of God that is absolutely so good that I'm just going to share it. I'm not going to summarize it. It's, it, I, it's more important to me that people understand. And I would rather use his than try to compare anything close. The word sovereign is not used in the King James Version of the Bible, which is interesting. But it is used 303 times in the Old Testament of the NIV Version but it's always used in association with the word Lord and is the equivalent of the King James Version's word, Lord, God. Not a single one of those times is the word sovereign used in the manner that it has come to be used in religion in our day and time. Religion has resulted in the invention of a new meaning for the word sovereign, which basically means God controls everything. Nothing can happen but what he wills or allows. However, there's nothing in the actual definition that states that. The dictionary defines sovereign as one, paramount and supreme, two, having supreme rank or power, three, independent or sovereign state, four, excellent. And none of these definitions means that God controls everything. It is assumed that since God is paramount or supreme that nothing can happen without his approval, that is not what the scriptures teach. In 2 Peter 3.9, Peter said, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. This clearly states that it's not the Lord's will for anyone to perish, but a lot of people are perishing. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, 
for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go thereafter. Matthew 7, 13, relatively few people are saved compared to the number that go lost by choice. God's will for people concerning salvation is not being accomplished. This is because God gave us the freedom to choose. He doesn't will anyone into hell. He paid for the sins of the whole world, but we must choose to put our faith in Christ and receive salvation. People are the ones choosing hell by not choosing Jesus as their savior. It is the free will of man that damns them, not God. People virtually have to climb over all the roadblocks that God puts in their way to continue on their course to hell. The cross of Jesus Christ and the drawing power of the Holy Spirit are obstacles that every single sinner has to encounter over and over. No one will ever stand before God and be able to fault him for withholding the opportunity to be saved. The Lord woos every single person to himself, but we have to cooperate with that. Ultimately, the Lord simply enforces the consequences of people's own choices. God has a perfect plan for everyone's life, but he doesn't make us walk out that plan. We are free moral agents with the ability to choose. He has told us what the right choices are, but he doesn't make those choices for us. God gave us the power to control our destinies. Typical teaching on the sovereignty of God puts Jesus in the driver's seat with us as a passenger. On the surface, that looks good. All of us have encountered the disastrous results of doing our own thing. We desire to be led by the Lord and teaching that nothing happens but what God wills fits that very nicely. However, the Bible paints a picture of each of us being behind the wheel of our own lives. We are the ones doing the driving. We are supposed to take direction from the Lord, but he's not going to force us to do that. Man has been given the authority over his own life, but he must have the Lord's direction to succeed. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks, that walks to direct his steps. God created us to be dependent on him and our independence is at the root of all of our problems. And as if it wasn't bad enough for man to try to run his affairs independently of God and God's standards, it has been made even worse by religion teaching us that all of our problems are actually blessings from God. That is a faith killer. It makes people totally passive. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And this verse makes it clear that some things are from God and some things are from the devil. We must submit to the things that are of God and resist the things that are from the devil. And the word resist means actively fight against it. Saying whatever will be will be is not actively fighting against the devil. If a person really believes that God is the one who puts sickness on them because he's trying to work something good in their life, then they should never go to the doctor and they should never take any medicine. That would be resisting God's plans. They should let the sickness run its course and thereby get the full benefit of God's correction. Of course, no one advocates that. That's absurd. It is even more absurd to believe that God is the one behind the tragedy. Acts 10.38 says that Jesus healed all of those who were oppressed of the devil. It was not God who oppressed them. It was the devil. It's the same today. Sickness is from the devil, not from God. We need to resist sickness and by faith submit ourselves to healing, which is from God through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I know some are thinking, what about the Old Testament instances where God smote people with sickness and plagues? There's a lot I could say about that, but if I had the space, if I had the space, but a simplified answer to that question is that none of those instances were blessings. They were curses. God did use sickness in the Old Testament as punishment, but in the New Testament, Jesus bore our curse for us. Galatians 3.13 The Lord would no more put sickness on a New Testament believer than he would make us commit a sin. Both forgiveness of sin and healing are part of the atonement Jesus provided for us. Deuteronomy chapter 28 should forever settle this question for all who believe the word of God. The first 14 verses of De Deuteronomy 28 list the blessings of God and the last 53 verses list the curses of God. 
Healing is listed as a blessing in Deuteronomy 28.4. Sickness is listed as a curse in Deuteronomy 28.22, 27, 28, 35, 59 to 61. God called sickness a curse. We should not call it a blessing. Knowing that God is not the author of my problems is one of the most important revelations that God has ever given to me. If I thought it was God who killed my father when I was 12 and some of my best friends before I was 20, if it was God who had people kidnap me, slander me, threaten to kill me, and turn loved ones against me, then I would have a hard time trusting God if he was like that. Remember, this is written by Andrew Womack, not me. <laughs> On the contrary, it is very comforting to know that God only has good things in store for me. Any problems in my life are from the devil or of my own making or just the result of life on a fallen planet. My heavenly father has never done me any harm. He never will, and I know that. I'm not saying that there is nothing to learn from hardships. Most of you reading this article have come to the Lord because of something in your life that overwhelmed you and caused you to turn to the Lord for help. That situation was not from God regardless of the results. It was you turning to the Lord and the faith you placed in him that turned your life around, not the actual hardship. If hardships and problems made us better, then everyone who has had problems would be better for them. Those who have the most trouble would be the best, and that simply is not so. Let me illustrate this story about my son Joshua, not my son, Andrew Womack's son. When he was only one year old, one years old, I was loading lumber on a large truck in the heat of a Texas summer. I had Joshua with me and he was having a hard time playing in the lumber yard. By mid, he was having a great time playing in the lumber yard. By mid afternoon, he was tired and sleepy and started to lie down in the dirt for a nap. I knew his mother wouldn't like that. So I put him in the cab of the truck to lie down and take his nap. He had been wanting to get into that truck all day, and when I put him there, he revived. I had to roll down the windows because it was hot, and Joshua was leaning out the windows waving at me in the side view mirrors. I told him to lie down and even gave him a spanking, but he didn't take heed. He leaned out the window too far, fell out of the cab, hit his eye on the running board, and landed on his head. I ran up to him, prayed over him, and held on to him until he quit crying. Then I told him that was why I told him to lie down and go to sleep and not lean out the window. I used that situation, which caused him great pain, to teach him. But if Joshua would not have been, if Joshua would have been like the sovereignty teachers of today, he would have gone out and told all of his friends that his father made him fall out of that truck to teach him how to obey. And that's not so. I did what I could to restrain him. I would be very hurt if that's how Joshua thought I was. Likewise, I don't believe it, it blesses our Heavenly Father for us to blame him for all the problems that come into our lives. Sure, he will comfort us when we turn to him in the midst of our problems, but he doesn't create the negative circumstances that hurt us. God is sovereign in the sense that he is paramount and supreme. There is no one higher in authority or power but that does not mean he exercises his power by controlling everything in our lives. Yeah. God has given us the freedom to choose. He has a plan for us. He seeks to reveal that plan to us and urge us to take that direction, but we get to choose. He doesn't make our choices for us. In many instances, it is our wrong choices that bring disaster upon us. In other cases, our problems are nothing but an attack from the devil and in some cases, natural forces of an imperfect world that cause us pain. Our tragedies are never the judgment or correction of God. Jesus came to give us abundant life. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't ever get that confused. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. And this is a fundamental doctrine of Christianity that must be understood properly if you want victory in your life. Believing that God controls everything renders a person passive. Why pray and believe for something better? Whatever God wants will come to pass that is simply not true. End of his teaching. We had a crisis going on last night. Um, a young lady was in some pretty serious psychosis. And I was trying to navigate actually two of these situations at a time. And it was a situation where you tell them you need to call 911. She's not safe to herself. You need to call 911. And the people that were helping 
did call 911 and they spoke to the police and the police said, is this so-and-so? This is common with her. This is pretty normal. We're not coming. Wow. And we thought, can you imagine? That's the reputation you have with the police of a big city. What if you really did need help? They're not coming. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. She wouldn't go to the hospital. She refused. This is mass. There's been multiple attempts of intervention here. We've been in a number of them. She calls my phone several times during the night. Um, I would listen to the messages because at this point I'm thinking there's a pattern here that needs to be broken. And she said, I need you to come over and just sit with me. And I'm thinking, nope, not doing that because you won't go where you should go, which is to the hospital or to treatment or to detox. That's where you need to be, but you won't go there. You just want all kinds of people to come sit with you while you indulge. So in the morning, she had left me multiple messages to call her. I called her about 11 o'clock this morning and I, she answered very clear headed actually. And I was surprised and I asked her, how are you today? And she says, well, I, I ended up in calling the ambulance on myself. And I said, well, that's probably good. I said, are you at the hospital? And she said, no, I'm, I'm back home. They sent me back home. And I said, now what? And she says, well, I'm gonna try to make it. And I said, okay, for the last 20 times, that's kind of what you keep saying to us. That's clearly not happening. You're obviously not in reality if you think we're not gonna get another call from you in a day or two and you're back they Uber alcohol to themselves. I don't know why people think they need to drive to the liquor store, but they don't. They can get it in a few minutes. And I said to her, I wanna be honest with you about something. Cause she talked about all these different religious people she had called and they had prayed with her. And I said, if you think that you're a follower of Jesus and that your safety will be eternity in heaven at the end of all this, I said, I'm, I'm here to warn you that that very likely isn't the case by what I see of your life. You're telling me that you're a Christian, but I have seen nothing in the last few months that looks like you follow Jesus, nothing. You follow addiction very closely and a lot of other behaviors that are prohibited for Christians inside of that behavior. I said, I'm not going to judge heaven or hell for you, but if I go by what the Bible says, I'd be terrified to die if I were you. I would be terrified to die because your behavior does not match what a born again believer says. She says, well, I'm sorry. I don't like what you just said because I've been told that when I sin, I will ask God to forgive me and he will. I said, well, the problem with that is, is that if you were a genuine born again believer, you would so hate that sin that you would stop doing it. You wouldn't keep having to do that. You would despise wickedness. That's the outcome that comes naturally from being a real born again Christian. You hate sin, you hate it. If you do it, you're so disgusted and upset about it that you run to your friends and you say, I'm not leaving you. I'm gonna sit right here with you. Don't let me do that again. I cannot do that again. Please help me not do that again. I said, it does not look like this. So I said, you need to humble yourself. You need to let go of self because you can't have this and heaven at the same time. She said, why doesn't anybody tell me that? I said, I just did tell you that. She goes, why hasn't anyone else told me that? I said, well, I don't know, but I did tell you that. So now you know. Pick a side and get on it. Because I said that group that you're counting on being okay in, that lukewarm group where I can have it all, Jesus said that group angers him more than any other group and he will spit you out his mouth. He hates those because she mentioned, I read my Bible and I say my prayers I have this checklist and I said, if your checklist could get you to heaven, Jesus didn't have to die. Your checklist, if that's what you're basing your getting to heaven on, replace the cross in your life, that is so offensive to God, I would not wanna face him with that explanation. What does God's sovereignty, 
How does it impact my everyday life? It calls for our submission. Just as peasants bowed before their king for fear of offending the one who had the authority over their life, God's sovereignty compels us to bow before him. But unlike corrupt earthly kings who abuse their authority and terrorize their subjects, God rules us with love. He loves us and he wants the best for us and he's eager to make it happen. Two, God's sovereignty provides us with comfort. But God makes that promise and millions throughout history have testified to the truth because God has proven his ability to back it up time and time again. Think about the implications of that promise. Because God is sovereign and he loves you, nothing will come into your life that he doesn't decree or allow. Well, if he's sovereign, you can take comfort that the outcome of however it came in and whatever it was is going to bring glory if you belong to him. He will work something amazing out of it. I certainly have seen the tragic deaths that come into families of very committed Christians and it's like, can you imagine that? But like my friend today who can't feel anything from his neck down, I see extraordinary fruit in his life that was never there before. I've gotten to see that transpire in people's lives, that extraordinary depth that comes when they submit their pain to Jesus Christ and let God work in that. You can sit with them for hours and not stop learning from them because it's so overwhelming to hear them speak. Three, God's sovereignty inspires us to worship him because God is completely worthy of worship and he's the only one. The biblical claims listed above are very specific reasons why we should worship him, but Psalm 41, one to two is another. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. The psalmist often worshiped God because God rescued him, God provided for him and led him. And it's important and good to worship God for the ways he works in a person's individual life. But the psalmist also shows us in Psalm 145, three, that Christians can always worship simply because God is worthy of worship. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And we see in these countries where people who are very solid committed Christians are in situations that are brought on by man and the wickedness of man. And we look at that and we think, where is God in that? And we see that the wickedness of man, the free will of man is bringing about some very, very tragic things. But when you look at what God says he will do with those people when they reach glory, this earth is a, this breath or life is a vapor. It is a mist, the Bible says, compared to eternity. Eternity goes to no end. Those who are martyred for their faith, which all, all of the disciples minus one were, those who gave their life for their faith, what awaits for them in heaven? It brings chills to me right now. I just had chills come through me. What awaits for them in heaven? We can't even wrap our heads around that. So what happens on this earth may look like God does not love his people, but God is not contained in this blip of time that we're here on earth. He's watching to see if we're faithful with whatever comes our way on this earth. What are you going to do with it? And then eternity will reflect that choice or those choices. And he talks about the positioning in heaven of the martyrs, those who literally gave their life for the gospel. He talks about the elevated place that they will have where all of heaven will know what they gave on earth for their faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing to lose in the suffering here if you continue to worship Jesus in it. I have lived my life on both sides of this. I have lived in great, great sin, knowing I was sinning. I know people tell me, not everyone says like you, Wendy, that you can't live with your boyfriend and have sex and not everyone's as rigid as you are. 
But I'll tell you, when I was out in sin and I was sexually immoral, I don't care who says what to me. I knew that was sin. I knew it. I didn't even read a Bible. But the inner core of me knew that offended God and it was unacceptable. I knew it. And he says, when we stand in front of him, we will be without excuse because we know we are sinning. We know it. And when we know it and we keep doing it, we are proving which side we are on for eternity at that moment, that we are not his. Because if we were his, we would be broken by that. Broken to the point that we would run from it. We would not keep doing it. We would be so broken by it. Those who sin know they're sinning. Those who stop sinning are the ones that love their Father in heaven. And we're in the final days. I think even the sinners know that. They tell me that. Let us not become part of anything that causes others to become disillusioned with the idea of following Jesus Christ because of what I heard from this young woman and others. They're mean. They're critical. Have you seen them arguing on Facebook? They judge. They're narrow in this opinion and they fight to the death for that opinion. They want to rally sides on things that are not eternal purposes. They want to divide and conquer over something that is not an eternal heaven or hell subject. It will die with the earth, but they get fixated and ruminate on it like they say we do on our drugs and Who's going to work for the police? Where they just get fixated on things like that, just like we do. Don't be one of those Christians. Be one of those Christians that knows your mission and that your mission is to build heaven, to become so loving that people are pulled to you. They're pulled to you because they want to know who are you? How did you get like this? You want to be that person that people are calling you saying, can we talk? Can I just get five minutes of your time? I have a few questions. That's the kind of people we need to be. We need to be about our father's business. And this is an eternal business. It isn't about temporal things. It is about eternity. If you're not serving him with eternity in mind in what you're doing, you're missing it. Be about sharing Jesus and get the gospel right because people's lives depend on it. People's eternity depends on it. Precious Lord, please help us. Please help us to not fear man and to not become obsessed with the world to not have anything that's more important to us than the person that's in front of us that doesn't have clarity on who you are. Help us to be wholly surrendered to you, Jesus, not walking mostly in, part way out, because we know anybody who's a part-time Christian is a mission field themselves. It's an illusion. Help us, Jesus, to abandon ourselves completely to you and completely to the true mission, which is to populate hell and stop all these people from, to populate heaven and stop all these people from going to hell that don't suspect they're going there. Help us to stay committed to the truth in the Bible. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.